Looks like we're about ready to go. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of research exchanges, these Wednesday noontime uh, discussions. Uh, my name is Gary Baldwin. I'm the Director of Special Projects here at Citrus in Berkeley, and I'd like to wel welcome you all here and to welcome those who are viewing us over the web, especially our sister campuses at UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, and UC Davis. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to also thank Infineon Technologies for providing the food, at least the food here in Berkeley. I don't know what's happening at the other campuses, but we uh, always enjoy Infineon's uh, uh, support. A couple of announcements before we begin today's uh, presentation, today's uh, talk by Richard Robinson. First, I'd like to in remind everyone and invite you to the Citrus Holiday Special and a gala celebration on uh, Friday, December the 12th at 4 p.m., that will take place, uh, uh, please correct me, Yvette, but that will take place here in the lobby of Hearst Mining as, as always, so 4 p.m. December the 12th. We have two other distinguished speakers who will be joining us in the coming weeks, James Kaufman from IBM Almaden on November the 10th, and the Danish ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Peterson, on December the 5th, will be speaking in the Sibley Auditorium in the, uh, the building next door. These are two very, very important and distinguished visitors. We invite you to join us for their presentations. Flyers that announce more of the details about their talks can be found on the table at the back of the room. <clears throat> and now to today's speaker, I'd like to introduce Richard Robinson, who is the Chief Operations Officer for the Department of Technology for the City and County of San Francisco. He also serves as the Chair for San Francisco's Committee on Information Technology, Architecture and Infrastructure subcommittees. Prior to joining the City of San Francisco, Richard served as the IT Director for Stanislaus County here in California. Richard has over 20 years of experience in IT, starting with the design and development of an international collaborative network for the Institute for Manufacturing and Automation Research and the Consortium for Advanced Manufacturing International under grants from the National Science Foundation. Richard received his engineering degree from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, and prior to moving to the public sector, he was a manager for Anderson Consulting, now known as Accenture, in the Communications High Technology and Media and Entertainment Group. And Richard's topic today is uh, City and County of San Francisco Public Safety Camera System, a project that involves some research going on here at Berkeley. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Richard to this afternoon's research exchange. Richard, thank you for coming. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> we good? Thank you. Um, Excuse me, Richard. There are seats down in front here for anyone who wants to move down and move off that bench in the back. They're, they're the cheap seats, so you can get them. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Gary and the folks at Citrus for inviting me to do this. Um, what I've tried to do over the last year or so is develop a relationship here with Citrus, the folks at Berkeley, because I think there's a lot of stuff that we do in the city and county of San Francisco that could use input from academic and engineering, uh, also the folks from Samuelson, and integrate that more tightly into some of the decisions that we make with taxpayers' dollars. Uh, with that, one of the programs that we had Citrus uh, help us out with and do some work with uh, is the city and county's public safety camera program. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the course of 40 minutes is take a project that seemed very simple up front that turned into something very, very complicated and now simplify this for a 40-minute conversation. Uh, what I'd like to cover just quickly from the top is, is talk about the history, talk a little bit about uh, my department, the Department of Technologies Operation and Infrastructure Group, uh, talk a little bit about what the intentions of this program and the pilot program were when it started, uh, talk about some of the issues that we had technologically, process-wise, architecturally. Uh, also, another thing that was one of the unintended consequences is trying to manage the media and the press when you're trying to deploy technology, uh, as well as uh, the involvement of Citrus here, some unintended consequences, and just where we're going to, to go forward from this point and the camera program. Uh, the history of this project, uh, this was something where there was intuitively just a good idea from somebody thinking that, hey, if I put a camera up, maybe I can deter some crime, maybe solve some crimes. Um, it just seemed like an intuitive thing. So the mayor came up with one of his initiatives, and it was to go ahead and put in a public safety camera system. Initially, it was a small amount of money, I think $100,000 to $200,000. 
Uh, it was going to be put out to bid and managed through the, depart through the city's uh, emergency communications and dispatch uh, division. Um, and, and it was to, to put some cameras up and hopefully the intent was to deter violent crime, I think was the initial intention. Um, from the outset, uh, they hired a contractor. The contractor came in, had some problems getting requirements from the end users. Uh, ended up being very expensive to deploy in the first two cameras. My department was also doing some work for some other departments with camera deployments. Uh, we went to the mayor's office. We said we had some equipment. We proposed a solution, and the Department of Emergency Management decided to go with us instead of the contractor that they had started with. A uh, brief history of, of my division, it is the Operations and Infrastructure Division. Uh, we manage the city's data centers at uh, One Market Plaza. We're also in charge of all of the network engineering and systems engineering for the infrastructure, network infrastructure for the city. Uh, we're also charged with the security architecture for the, the, the city. Um, we also manage the design and development of all of the other departments' architectures with the city. Uh, we also manage telecommunications, which is the PBX infrastructure for the city and county, the wired and wireless infrastructures. Uh, we manage public safety networks, so the radio, those big radio towers, the 800, 700 megahertz systems, as well as the emergency telecom systems. And we manage CLETS, which is the California law enforcement telecommunication systems for the city as well. Um, the division also supports production applications for the city's financials. Uh, retirement, treasurer, tax collector, uh, law enforcement, justice, as well as the city and county's internet and intranet sites. Uh, recently, we also, through uh, acquisitions, acquired the, the city's reprographics department as well. So it's a large organization within the Department of Technology, probably about 80% of the organization. Our annual budget is about uh, $80 million for the department. Uh, what's important is every single one of these groups had to work together uh, for, for what would seem like a simple deployment is just putting up cameras. Uh, from the design of the, the infrastructure to actually pulling wired uh, to fiber, uh, putting in wired uh, and wireless networks, uh, putting in the applications, as well as designing this uh, as we went forward. Uh, again, the intentions of the program were, 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 were fairly basic. Uh, it was to deter crime. Put up a camera. If people see a camera, they'll uh, probably not commit the crime or else they'll move the crime to somewhere else. Uh, also, what they wanted to do was store the data uh, from these videos for a short amount of time. Uh, but there was also some political overtones to this. The city is very sensitive to people's personal freedoms. Um, and they wanted to make sure that any technology that was deployed took that into consideration. So one of the things that was uh, cast as far as what we had to do was the system could have no active surveillance. So there wasn't the point where people would be monitoring actively people. There were cameras there to capture something. If something happened, there was a process to go back and get that information and then either give it to law enforcement or to, to a public defender or whomever needed it for whatever event had taken place in front of that camera. So those were the intentions. Um, the department uh, went back to the Department of Emergency Management. We gave them some designs. Initially, they wanted to do uh, cable um, infrastructure. We decided to go with the digital infrastructure. They liked that. Uh, also, the cameras, we spent an, uh, an incredible amount of time vetting out different types of cameras. Uh, the one we des uh, decided on was actually one that was used by the Israeli defense um, industry. Uh, the cameras are very good. They have very high resolution. What we would find out is the resolution of the camera would be the last of our problems. Uh, also, the cost for the city to do it internally versus externally was much better for the city. We were able to do it cheaper than going out to vendors because this seemed to be an area where the subject matter expertise came at a high cost. Uh, also, since it was supported by the city's crew, we were able to respond more quickly to any type of maintenance issues that were needed with the camera system. Uh, when we sat down originally, the, what was interesting about this was here was an intuitive idea. What was really then became a technology looking for a problem. Uh, there was no real defined user group at the end of the day saying, what is it that we specifically want to capture? Why is it that we want to capture it? What should it look like? Who's going to view it? What is the process going to be for vetting it? Again, it just went back to the simple idea. Here's a camera. It will deter crime. Uh, but as a technology department, we had to take a, a step back and, and ask some simple types of questions. Uh, what type of cameras should be used for what types of applications? 
Uh, we realized that one size didn't fit all for the cameras in talking to the police department. There were certain areas that needed a certain type of camera, a certain type of approach. Um, they, you had to almost anticipate where crime was going to occur, uh, which is very difficult to do. So we would look at a basic area and we would say, okay, they expect a crime to occur 30 feet from the camera, 100 feet from the camera, 200 feet from the camera within this type of frame. What type of camera should we use? Um, what type of resolution should it be? Also, we needed to discuss the quality of the pictures. Uh, since the initial program did not have a lot of funding, data retention was a huge issue up front. We knew to get a higher frame rate would require larger databases, uh, larger file storage. We didn't have the funds, so we had to start making some concessions from the beginning as to the frame rates that we would capture as well as the quality of the images that we should. Um, changes, when we would look at certain sites, we also started to evaluate whether we could actually change the environment instead of change the camera system to better accommodate us. Uh, we also had to go through the process of software evaluations, uh, hardware um, and software reporting processes as part of our daily operations, uh, the, the responsibilities of the system. So if someone thought that there was a, a crime that occurred in our, in our area, what was the process for which we would go back, get those films, under who would have the, the, the chain of custody for that? Uh, also, how were we going to fund new installations and ongoing maintenance? We were given a small amount of money to do a pilot project. If you spend all that money on your initial project and you have something go wrong, you no longer have a project. Uh, also, we experienced a lot of technical issues while we were deploying the pilot. I'll talk about some of those later on. Uh, as well as understanding what was the staffing requirements to actually deploy a public safety camera system. When we were through with the process, we actually ended up, um, as it stands today, deploying 71 cameras throughout the city and the county. Uh, these are approximately 16 to 19 locations, depending on how you define a location, because in some areas, um, there is a number of cameras that view a certain area and there's also some cameras that are in close proximity that view a different area. So uh, as a matter of semantics, um, that's how we define what the area is. Um, nine of these units that we determined uh, we put in are actually 360 degree cameras. There's some upside and downside to those. Um, when we're done with this in question and answers, if you have specific questions, we can talk about those. Uh, also, we went with 36 units of, thir of 3 megapixel. Uh, from my perspective, at going at the high-end frame rates with these, these do give very good quality pictures for, for video capture. Uh, we also went with 21 units of 5 megapixels. Uh, we also have some special cameras that we put in for license plate capture. Um, some of the issues with those are it's a very defined area which you're capturing. Um, it's very helpful to, to narrow your, your frame with which you're trying to capture things. Um, also, the initial requirement for us was only to store stuff for three days. So when we initially scoped this out, we, we, we filled that requirement. Uh, it was almost immediately that they came back to us and said we need to change that requirement from three to seven days. Uh, that, it, that caused a big problem for us from the beginning, and this would translate into larger problems uh, when the media found out about this. Um, today, and, and something that's interesting, there's actually been a resolution passed, so it is actually city ordinance for us to maintain um, this data for 30 days, which fiscally we cannot do, so this is another issue that we need to resolve. Uh, the process for the, the camera program, initially it started off with one site that um, the police said, hey, we have, got, we, we have high crime in this area, uh, would like to sit down with you guys and see if we could put up a camera system. Uh, we sat down with them, we found one, we, we spec'd it out for them, and we put it up. Subsequently, the police commission and also board of supervisors within the city and county of San Francisco uh, invoked a provision which actually made us go through a vetting process to put camera systems up. And essentially what that would mean was we would have to sit down with the police department. They would determine which were high sensitive or high crime areas from them based on statistics. Uh, we would evaluate an area. We would have to submit the evaluation of the area to a police commission to review. Um, then once we did that, we would actually have to publish to the citizenship where we were putting up cameras. We would put very large signs telling them within 30 days we were going to put up cameras. If they wanted to protest this, they could come and there was a process for them to do this. Uh, as well as we would have to run ads on the local cable television programs. Um, 
as well as post other signs and let people know that the cameras were coming. Uh, and then after that period had been expired, we would go back, give another presentation, and then we, we would be approved to, to go ahead and put the cameras up. Uh, which was interesting because from a, from a statistical standpoint, I thought we were undermining what we were trying to accomplish from the beginning. So we, we were already telling people that we were putting the cameras here and we may have effectively been affecting the statistics of capturing crime. Um, so that was the typical process. And so every time that we would identify a new location, we would have to go through this process. And what was interesting is you would put the signs up and people would go tear them down. So the process would start over and over again. Uh, so essentially this is kind of what um, the process would look like. We would, the, the police department would give us information uh, based on statistics. So we would sit down with them and we would try to plot out the area using the different types of cameras and, and come up to some consensus of what the strategy uh, for the camera location would be. Um, and then also what we had to do as part of the process is put up signs so the police commissions and others could see that with the designated areas that we were proposing to put cameras that we gave signage up that would let people from all different angles see that we were going to be putting cameras up at some point in time. Uh, so as you can see here for the four cameras that we put up, we've got two, 12, about 12 different signs that we would have to put up and maintain to let people know that the camera systems were coming. Uh, also one of the requirements is that the signs uh, be sensitive to the areas and the uh, local languages so we would sometimes end up posting these signs and having to put them up in four or five languages to let people know uh, what cameras were coming in and when they would be coming in. Here's another location, uh, same thing, same process. The initial architecture for the program, uh, since it was a pilot, was to do these individually. It was, um, they were all independent installations. They were put on wireless backhaul on a 2.4 gigahertz um, uh, spectrum network. Um, the problems that we had with that was it is a public network, so there was a lot of interference in that. Um, so we had initially set a frame rate for the camera systems at four frames per second. Uh, but because of the interference, the actual frame rate was dropping anywhere from one frame per second to uh, one frame every four seconds. Uh, one of the problems that we experienced is by ordinance, we were not allowed to actually view what we were capturing unless there was a crime and we went through the process of, uh, of asking to retrieve our video. Uh, subsequently, we were able to change that, but it was the point where we, we couldn't get feedback from our own system. So we wouldn't know if there was a problem with the video capture until this actually got vetted out through a public defender or through a district attorney or through the police department. So that was one of the things from the outset uh, that was a problem for us. We did start to move those off of that and moved it to a public safety network, which was a 4.9. Um, that helped considerably break down on the interference because it was um, licensed spectrum for us. Um, subsequently, to maintain the frame rates, we have started to move all of these uh, camera systems to a fiber network, uh, which has been very helpful for us. Uh, there are still some that are sitting on a wireless network, um, but since we have been, um, we are in a moratorium of spending on that, we, we still have some locations that we have to move to fiber. Uh, and they're off. Um, this is one of those things where you get a project and you learn over time, especially in operations, the first question to ask is how can this go wrong? Uh, this seemed like a very simple project, like I said from the outset, put some cameras up, hopefully it would capture something. Uh, they would, uh, the district attorney's office would be able to use it. Um, after a couple months of deployment, uh, a newspaper article uh, came out where a public defender had claimed uh, that video would have exonerated a client. Uh, they went to the video, the video quality was poor. Um, again, this is one of those issues where we were unable to really see what the end result was until it, it, it came out uh, through, through various means. Um, and from that point, we actually took a lot of criticism for the, the project. Um, the Chronicle ran a lot of articles, I have a couple of them up here. Uh, San Francisco security cameras choppy video. Uh, it's a crime. San Francisco surveillance cameras are a flop. 
Uh, crime cameras not capturing many crimes. Uh, San Francisco board panel imperils crime watching gear. So what was interesting about this is really learning to, to manage the media and manage the expectation. Uh, we had to state over and over, this was a pilot, this was a, a very small funded project that was really set out to learn how camera system worked, what was effective, what was ineffective before spending a lot of money. In contrast, you know, we looked at different cities and, and Citrus did this as part of their research, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. Um, the amount of money that they spent are orders of magnitude higher than what the city was. But the expectation immediately was, since we put in camera systems, that there were people watching cameras all the time, that these were CSI quality uh, videos that, you know, with all of the, the, the flash and the swish, um, and that um, these were throughout the entire city. And that really wasn't the case. I mean, here was just a discrete technology program, but immediately the impression uh, and the perception of the program was much larger than it was, and this became a difficult problem for us not only to maintain the camera system, but to also just justify a pilot project. So, uh, Enter Citrus. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to do and I felt strongly about is here was a good technology that was taking uh, probably some improper scrutiny. And what we needed to do is take a step back and, and be more objective and be more methodical about what we wanted to do. Uh, from an operations manager, what was important to me is if we were going to spend city and county's money on crime, crime reduction in certain areas, I wanted to know that there was some type of metric, some type of return on investment, or at least something that would help me establish why should I put a camera where, which camera should go first, what type of camera, what is it that I'm trying to capture. These are things that really weren't talked about up front. So as someone that's deploying technology, even though you have an intuitive uh, project that you're given, I think it's very important to, to reframe it and make sure that you have these things up front. And looking back in hindsight, this is probably one of the things that I would have changed with the camera project was actually before we spent a dime on any deployment is make sure that we had these things. We had the business owners, we had the business requirements, we had the metrics. But what was interesting is in looking out there, no other cities had done this either. That's why it was unique and I thought fortuitous to, to sit down with Citrus and actually do this. No other city's doing this. And no other city is encumbered uh, with kind of the, the political overtones that San Francisco has uh, with as, as far as deploying these. Chicago and other cities, they actively monitor. They've got closed circuit. The intention is absolutely different. But the public's perspective isn't. They expect you to be doing what's being done in New York, what's being done in Chicago. So we, we wanted to, the, the folks at Citrus to, to work with the folks at Samuelson to, to do a, a, an efficacy study. Go out there, tell us what we have, and how it measures up against what other cities and counties and municipalities are doing. Um, there was a, an incredible amount of pressure to define this value too. Even when we went into the budget process, um, the mayor's budget office asked us to define metrics. If you're going to get funded on this, how do we know what the return on investment is, what are the metrics. Um, also, we, we needed to, going forward, figure out you know, what, what is the political purpose of this, what is the business value of this project, not is just what, what is the technical capability. Uh, and again, what was important to me is that we could justify what we did versus what other cities did and how they came about, how they got their funding, how it was maintained from a funding perspective, uh, as well as were they measuring uh, efficiencies in their systems. Um, the unintended consequences of this. When, when it set out the, the 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 intent was to deter violent crime. I think some of the stuff that has come out uh, and I know Citrus's report will be coming out in a few days. Uh, I can't talk a lot about that until it actually does, but I think one of the things that we did find is, is, is there was a reduction in crime in certain areas. Um, it wasn't the ones that they expected. Uh, I think when they took a, back, took a step back statistically, they realized that violent crime uh, is kind of an anomaly. Uh, to catch certain types of violent crime on camera or even more of an anomaly, what we saw was some of the things like larceny, theft, there was a reduction in those. One of the things that wasn't un uh, intended. Um, another unintended consequence was kind of undue uh, attention to this. 
Um, being able to manage that understanding, again, you know, from a technical standpoint and operational, asking yourself at the beginning of the day, this is a great project, it has some intuitive value, how can it go wrong? We need to manage that. Um, we did find ourselves at one point in time spending about 80 to 90 percent of our operational time just trying to manage the media and the request instead of the, the, the technical solution itself. Uh, also, ownership questions. Once this actually did hit the media, no one wanted to own it. Uh, you have a police department that didn't really want to own it because they saw it as a technology solution. You saw a Department of Emergency Management that really didn't want to own it because they saw it as a police uh, program. You had a Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice that really didn't want to own it because they saw the police department as the user. Um, it's very important to get those buyers in up front and have the, the subject matter own it. Again, the problem with this, though, is you do have a lot of people that have a vested interest in it one not more so than the other. So how do you define who the owner is up front is very, very important. Going forward, um, what I talked about, the Citrus Report is coming out in a few days. I think uh, I'm actually very proud that the city did this. I'm proud of what uh, Citrus has done and what Samuelson has done uh, because other cities haven't done it, and I think it's important that they do do it. There is a lot of attention on this report. I've, We've gotten phone calls from other police departments. Uh, initially, they were concerned. It was, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? Uh, you're going to now bring the same type of criticism and pressure on us to do the same types of things. Um, so I think it's a good thing uh, in the end. Um, after that, so the Citrus Report comes out. There will be some police commission hearings that will actually talk about the findings in the Citrus Report. Um, also, it is going to be very important that the city does define an end user group. Uh, I think we're already seeing who that's going to be. Uh, it won't be the Department of Technology. Um, also, once that's done, I think there's enough practical information here for us to, to then take a step back and do a complete redesign of the network. This was built as a pilot. It was built as ad hoc. We've learned a lot of lessons. I think we have a better understanding how to build uh, a more integrated public safety camera system uh, that also is much more cost effective than what we put in to date. Uh, redesign. Some of the lessons that we learned, I know this is hard to read, this is, becomes more of the, the technical stuff. Um, one of the things is because we couldn't surveil these, these were static cameras, what you would end up doing is finding a location and putting four or five cameras to try capturing the entire uh, environment. That's not effective. At the end of the day, you really do need cameras that have the ability to move. The pan, tilt, zoom is very, very important, but what that did is it gave the impression of active surveillance, and so therefore from the initial, uh, from the outset, it was decided not to go with those. I think the lesson learned is the static cameras are not the way to go. We have to move to a pan, tilt, zoom system. Um, actually, the, the second recommendation, which I, I, I disagree with, uh, was to increase the number of the cameras at each location. I think by moving to a PTZ and giving people the ability to, if an alarm or a trigger goes off, to, to manage that camera becomes much more cost effective than putting up five or six cameras to capture the same type of area. Uh, one of the technical things that became very important and one of the issues is not all cameras are equal when it comes to lighting. Um, so we needed to have the ability to effectively control the illumination per sites. Uh, cameras are, 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 are built to um, do much better in certain lighting conditions. Some did very well during the day, some did very well at night. It was, it was hard to find one that did both uh, for, for both conditions. Uh, another part of the redesign is to replace all of the re remaining wireless backhauls that we can't get to fiber to the public safety network. Uh, also increase the storage to 30 days. Um, this one's interesting because it is a very, very expensive proposition. Um, that was one of the um, <coughs> reality checks that supervisors and others had when they wanted to move from just the, the few day data retention uh, to the 30 and in, in some instances they would like to see this data in perpetuity, uh, but the cost for that is very, very uh, expensive. Uh, also, to integrate the facility cameras into one system and enable a owner to, to, to view this stuff. Having it uh, fragmented is very ineffective, uh, as well as when you have to go back and get actual video from incidents, uh, makes it very complicated. Uh, integration. One of the things that we began to look at is the city has also deployed another technology called, uh, we call it shot spotters. It's a gunshot location system. Uh, there are three active pilots within the city. It's essentially 
a sensor-based uh, area. We've got three square miles in the city that now have that. So when a gunshot goes off, it actually sends an alarm to uh, a local patrolman and to emergency dispatch. Uh, the idea is to move to a pan tilt zoom camera so when a gun, uh, uh, the gunshot location sensor goes off, the cameras can actually redirect themselves to capture what would be the potential area of the event. Um, one of the things in doing this is it actually gets us to where I think we would like to go and that is the ability to reduce the amount of cameras, um, put in some intelligence into the system, into the, the system that enables triggers or some type of alarm that if an event is taking, is taking place that now command and control can be given to someone to actively surveil the situation. Um, I, again, I think these things go hand in hand. One of the things that we've also been looking at as part of this in some uh, off-sites is putting in intelligent systems and monitoring. Uh, there are some software tools that we've been evaluating that let us establish certain areas um, and also certain types of thresholds and triggers if it sees certain types of shapes or in any change in the environment, it can send us an alarm that something has taken place. We actually deployed this about a month ago and we caught a burglar on our own site. So the, the proof was in the pudding. Uh, also, as I said before, reduce the number of cameras. I think this is a big thing to help for the cost efficiency. There really is no need. However, this is one of those difficult things is you have to battle with the kind of political encumbrance. Um, there's a large group of people that feel very firm uh, about uh, having cameras in public to begin with. Um, so now trying to, to balance and reconcile technology with the social need is something that we're, we're, we're working with. Um, in concluding on this, uh, my position as the operations officer for this, there is value in the public safety camera system. Um, how you manage that, how you manage that expectation, uh, also how you manage the process is something that has been very interesting. Up front it seemed very simple. Uh, it has turned out to be something that <coughs> excuse me, has been very complicated. I think it will probably get more complicated as we go forward. Um, I imagine that as we find new technologies, I hope those help resolve the difference between the, the social, political, and the technical pieces to it. And I, I firmly believe that there are technical solutions to that. But again, it's very important to get the user community together and come up with a consensus as to what it is that you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to measure that. I think there is a very strong value in the, the government academic vetting of this. Um, I would like to come back to, to, to Citrus uh, on some of the other programs that we're doing to get this third party, this objective view on what it is that we're trying to apply uh, from a technical standpoint and making sure that it's in alignment with social, best social practices and that we've looked at all of the different types of issues and that we're, we're creating kind of a cycle where we're taking that information and putting it back into the technology. Uh, again, like I've said before, wh what's very important is to make sure that the intentions in a technical program are spelled out very well up front. Um, even when you have projects that seem very intuitive, very low dollar, um, again, it can go wrong if it's not properly managed. Uh, again, it's very important to make sure that you have those shareholders and those technical requirements and those business specifications done before you go forward with anything. Uh, with the camera system, one thing too, one size does not fit all. Each environment requires a different type of camera. It's a different type of situation. Uh, setting that expectation up front is very important. Um, also, there was a lot of unstated value that we're still trying to capture. I think some of this will come out in the Citrus report. Um, there's value that we don't capture to detectives. Um, it may not capture a crime, but it has had a huge value in letting them see that a crime didn't commit there, so they're not wasting a lot of resource. So there's kind of this anti-value that we need to capture that the cameras give us. Uh, also, it needs to, the user community really clearly needs to be vetted out and defined what the roles and the responsibilities are. Um, it, it's just, again, it's, it's basic project management, basic technical project. Make sure that you have all of this stuff done up front or you run the risk of having your problems, your, your projects uh, come out of control and may, not, may actually end up hurting you instead of helping you when you knew that there was some inherent value in the projects that you were taking on. Questions? Very interesting question, yes, back there. Hi. Um, 
Throughout your talk, you've been sort of dancing around but never actually mentioning the word privacy. Um, and uh, I assume that's what you mean when you talk about things like undue uh, expectations and um, um, unstated this and that. Um, and, and I find this very disturbing that you seem, in fact, not to care at all about privacy except as um, something that hinders you doing the work that you want to do. Um, that, that's really, really, really shocking. I can't understand how a public official can give a talk like this and not say anything about the privacy implications of the work. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Actually, actually the contrary. I, I think the, the privacy issue is very important to us. That's why we reached out to Citrus and to Berkeley and Samuelson. Because candidly, I think if anyone's going to look at us uh, in a very stringent light on what we're doing, it's going to be this community. Uh, I think it's unprecedented that a municipality actually reach out to what would be considered its most adamant detractor in this to, to figure out what is the expectation. It was interesting in the police commission hearings because it was almost 50-50, and people were very polar and very vocal on what they wanted. Half of the community wanted those cameras. They wanted to know that there was protection, there was people helping them in a public area. On the other side of it was people that were very adamant that they didn't want cameras in their life. We have to balance this. Uh, you know, as, as a taxpayer and also someone that implements tax dollars, I want to make sure that we're taking that into consideration. That's why we reached to the partners that we did. It is very important to us. Um, San Francisco is very progressive uh, when it comes to technology and its deployment. And so we do take that into consideration. But we have to take a step back and understand we have constituents on both sides uh, of the opinion spectrum on this. I have uh, one question from UC Merced, and he wanted you to uh, please address the uh, City of London has deployed security cameras with very good results, and how did they achieve that? Uh, actually, the London one, I think, is actually addressed a little bit in the Citrus report. Um, so if I could defer that to that coming out in a couple of days. I have a question about this active monitoring requirement, and I want could you speak more about exactly where that came from? Because you uh, indicated there's a mix, mix match of uh, expectations between at least the media and, and that requirement. And does the public expect that? Or do you have any indication that the public expects that? Well, that's, that's one of the things that we wanted to, to get out of the study. Because we heard the expectation was, was all over the board from, from the public. I mean, some of them expected it, some of them didn't. We were given a very clear directive. There will be no active surveillance. Uh, so from a technical standpoint, that made it very clear to me what my technical solution would have to be. Um, and this comes from our elected officials, our board of supervisors, the police commission, and the mayor. The, the city's uh, position on this was that there would be no active surveillance. Was there another question? I have one if there, there wasn't. Yes, here, sir. If you take a location where it appears that crime just goes on constantly. Say 16th and Mission, take Market Street between. What's the actual hour-to-hour -hour police presence in a place like that? Are there, in fact, policemen like constantly there? Because you would think, you know, if literally any time any policeman's there, there's somebody to arrest. Given just every time I walk through, I see crime. You know, so how in practice? Because it would seem like if you really have a constant police presence, the need for cameras. You know, the policemen are the best cameras. Agreed. <laughs> um, to that, I can't speak specifically, you know, what the police's, you know, frequency, what their beat patrols are there. Um, the idea, again, from the technical standpoint was if the police knew a crime had occurred, then they could actually go back and either recreate what had happened to that point or post that point. So really, from a technical standpoint, we're there just as hopefully some type of catalog of information as to what hurt, what, what had happened. But part of the predicament that we're forced with is someone has to go and request that and say, this crime we think happened here at this time. Do you have evidence of that or evidence that that did not occur? Uh, Richard, what are the opportunities for, <clears throat> how should I say, more of a research thrust in these camera studies? Uh, what I mean by that is, for instance, 
people are working on very fancy algorithms for doing motion capture and study, to try and identify some activity that's going on. Is there an opportunity in the next phase of this for the introduction of uh, algorithms or, or tech, uh, software technologies that would look and, and try and do some sort of uh, analysis, uh, preliminary analysis of what's taking place in the scene? Is, there, is that part of the plan or what, what does it look like going forward? Well, for, from the city's perspective, <clears throat> I, I would love to see that. I, I mean, that's one of the things that I would hope that the, the relationship with the city and citrus would get. You know, we talked when we sat down initially. We we kind of scoped out a large project. You know, what could the role of academics be, engineering, design, and develop with social social problems? Um, we had to pare back because of funding the, the work that was done here with the Citrus one to just let's, let's look at the efficacy of a program. But ideally what I would like to see is, is that where we're getting input from the community saying this is what the expectation is, this is what we'd like to accomplish. Can technology provide a solution? What tends to happen is we have technology pushing social response instead of social response kind of driving technology. And I think this is one of those, pro one of those projects where hopefully we can turn that around. So as we go through this and, and we learn from the Citrus Report, as we learn from our evaluations, as we learn from the user community what the expectation is, technology hears that and they develop that into the solutions that they provide. I noticed that we have the executive director of uh, Trust Center here in uh, the front row, Larry Rohrbaugh, and we have Jen King from the Samuelson Center. Uh, if you all have comments that you'd like to make, oh, there's another question. Okay, let's take the question first, and then if you have comments you'd like to make in in this setting, no? Okay. Okay, next question. One of the issues that you left out was um, why a private company couldn't do it. It seems to me that there's other kinds of quasi-surveillance things that happen through private companies, like taking cameras of cars that... Um, that go by red lights. Um, so I was I was wondering about that, and maybe you could also address that if it is. I don't know, if it's within the Citrus report. I, mean, I know you you want to leave that for a while, but I thought you could probably give us in terms of a framework of how the of what Citrus contributes technically or non technically to the to the uh, project. So the first question was, uh, I think you're asking why private sector versus the, 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 the public sector doing this. Uh, this one was straightforward on cost and deliverables. Uh, the city does have a process where they put out requests for, uh, requests for, propo for proposals and information. Uh, they vet that against what the city can do. The city was able to do the, the, the job that was designed cheaper and more effectively. So that's why they went with this for this particular program. I mean, there are different solutions. I mean, the public safety camera system isn't the only camera system within the city. Lots of departments have their own localized security. So, so some of those may be given to, to private vendors. Uh, as far as the expectation for the Citrus, like I said, I wanted to take a look at this from a more holistic view and a broader thing. I mean, I would like to have... Um, academics involved in social policy in driving us, especially when it comes to um, technology. I don't think that there's enough of this. Uh, so what I would like to see is, is a continued uh, relationship with these type of entities to help us do those and vet those types of issues. So you said that uh, you had to, you have a mandate to ma maintain video for 30 days, and I suppose um, that there wasn't a, a particular application in mind for this, right? So what, what exactly, why is it that you're, ma that you're mandated to keep this video for so long? Uh, right now, the, the mandate was passed through the, board of, through, through the Board of Supervisors for the city and the county, and it was to retain data. Uh, so if um, someone had evidence of a crime that we could actually go back further because the amount of time that it took for them to uh, identify that a crime had happened and get the information, generally the three to seven days would have passed. So the ability to store that information uh, we did not have so that wouldn't be there. So it was to extend that so that they would have that, that capability. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Jen King. I'm actually the lead author on the report that I presume Rich has mentioned, in, at least in passing. Unfortunately, it, it, it's not coming out before next Wednesday, I, I believe, if, if, if things are still going the way we're planning. Uh, so I can't discuss any of the findings. But just to build on something uh, Rich said, 
Uh, we took a very holistic approach to evaluating the system. Part of it was a technical evaluation where we looked at the city's infrastructure and things like servers and uh, camera capabilities and the actual like network capacity, but a larger part of it was to actually perform um, both a quantitative analysis of the uh, criminal reports, incident reports that have come in through the police to detect whether or not there's been any influence on the uh, cameras on crime rates in the uh, areas immediately surrounding the cameras as well as concentric bands uh, moving outwards from the camera uh, sl spots as well as to do a uh, qualitative analysis where we looked at both kind of the legal side and the policies that were in place and how they affected the system as well as we talked to over 30 people um, including a number of police officers, public defenders, district attorneys and did a qualitative analysis based on what people told us about their experience using the camera system to put a whole picture together of how the whole thing worked in sum. And so uh, the plan right now is that we'll be presenting those results to the police commission next Wednesday and it'll likely go out to the press at that time as well so you guys may read about it next week and hopefully there'll be links available so if you want to check out the report and see what we did um, that should be available online as well. So if you see a lot of SFPD officers here on campus next Wednesday, you'll know it did not go well uh, in, in, in San Francisco. Other questions? Richard, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Thanks.